This is a video based on material I prepared for a talk I'm due to give in Spain at the start of April. Whether I give this in Spain or not is now up in, or up in the air a bit because they may ask me to talk on a different topic. But the topic I had planned to talk on was how the impending environmental catastrophe that Europe and the world faces can only be solved by moving to a system of economic planning. The outline of the talk is first to look at the environmental threats and the context that we're in. That involves looking at deep history, food constraints, heat constraints. Then look at the structural changes in the mode of production that are going to have to come about. What's going to go? What's going to replace it? And then compare dealing with this with an in-kind versus in the money in the economy. And look at cybernetic regulation and the replacement of money. Now, we're going to face a different Europe, but there have been very different Europes in the past. Here I show the spread of glaciation and retreat of glaciation uh, in the last ice age. And you can see that as the glaciers retreat, there is a big shift in land area. Areas that were previously sea become land and previously um, shallow seas become deep seas and large areas that were once covered by ice become free of ice. Coastlines change, radical differences in climate. Now that seems a very long time ago but if we look at the previous, a previous Europe, a Europe during the Ice Age and ask yourself how much of that would have been suitable for human habitation? How much of it would have been suitable for agriculture. Probably only the area of Spain and the Balkans, Balkans and southern Italy would have been suitable for agriculture. In other areas the climate would have been too severe to have allowed this. Now it only took four degrees climate change to go from that Europe to the Europe we have now. And here's a, a time chart of temperature from the last ice age to now. And there is this very rapid rise in temperature from the ice age to the Holocene. This is shown as occurring over maybe a thousand years or so, but it's, it's now reckoned that if you look at the end of the Younger Dryas, the really rapid change in climate occurred in as little as 50 years. And this indicates that you can get sharp, very sharp changes in climate in a short period of time. The shift from the end of the Ice Age to the current Holocene period was marked by an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide of around 100 parts per million, which is comparable to, to human releases. Now the interesting thing about this is if you plot on this, when did agricultural societies arise? You see that it was almost immediately after the Ice Age that you start to get actual, the first settlements based on agriculture, Katalhuyuk in Turkey, in Anatolia, the first town in general European region based on agriculture is there at 7,500 BC, 9,500 years ago. Very shortly after the end of the Ice Age. And that was a 4 degree C change that produced that. There's Katahuyuk in Turkey. These are the, the buildings that archaeologists have excavated. Now let's look somewhere else. Let's go and look at the High Arctic. And we'll look at California. Here in California you can see redwood trees. We're familiar with redwood trees growing in California. But if you go to the High Canadian Arctic, there are stumps of redwood trees there. Just how far north they are is quite striking. Axel Heidelberg Island level with the north of Greenland. It's now a 
a barren Arctic waste. But at one time it was warm, warm enough for California intact vegetation. Fossils that found there include alligators. The climate change required to produce these circumstances is within the range of projected changes over the next two centuries. It has happened in the past, and if you look at the extreme range of projected changes, they're of that degree. Climate change produces social change. The end of the last ice age meant the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. Hunting no longer became a viable lifestyle. It forced the adaptation of agriculture in Anatolia. Subsequently, the Indo-European peoples, based on agricultural production, spread across Europe and, and across India and the Middle East. So the current population of Europe is a consequence of the economic changes that followed on from climatic change at the end of the last ice age. Also, changes in basic forms of energy produce social change. If you go back to feudal Europe, it relied on natural energy sources. Human muscles, horses, water wheels, charcoal as a fuel. Then you've got the exhaustion of, fossil, of forest fuels. Forests were cut down to provide charcoal for the iron industry. This then led to the development of the use of coal as an alternative fuel. And with this new energy source came steam power, and with steam power came capitalist Europe. We have to ask what is going to happen with the end of fossil fuel. We know it's producing global warming. What else will it produce in the way of social change? You have to realize that we're facing comparable changes to those which occurred with the end of the last glaciation. There is a glaciation still in existence. It's on Greenland and, and Antarctica. And as things are projected, that glaciation is going to be eliminated. The glaciers are going to melt. The permafrost areas are going to thaw. Changes comparable to those which occurred across the European continent, across North America at the end of the last ice age, are going to occur over the next two centuries. Here are some impressions of what that implies. We have to be planning for the end of capitalist civilization, and I'm going to focus on the four F's I call them food, fuel, fire, and flood. First thing to look at is food. There have been many studies of the impact of climate change on world food production, and they're all to a greater or lesser extent, negative. They all indicate that food production will become markedly worse. How much worse is what they differ on? Um, I'm reproducing a set of maps here from a study in 2004, which gave projections for 2020, 2050, and 2080. And green on these maps shows an improvement in food production. Yellow to brown shows food production getting worse. And you can see that in the pessimistic scenarios, food production is going to get dire across the whole world. Even on the... Um, optimistic scenario, large areas of Africa and uh, Eastern Europe, Eurasia, become really bad for food production, maybe 20% lower. India, um, much of 
uh, South America has significant losses. When you go to the pessimistic scenario, even by 2050, only a few areas of the world have less than a 2% fall in food production, or at least of cereal production. Zoom in a bit to the best case scenario for 2050. We can see there are still some areas, Canada, um, Argentina, much of Europe, which are projected to, to have benefited a bit from the climate change. But if you shift to the pessimistic scenario by 2050, all of these areas are, are doing much worse, and you're only scraping by in Europe and Canada. So what does this imply? It means a long-term rise in world food prices. It implies increasingly frequent famines when there are widespread harvest failures. It means for Europe the inability of uh, to, the in possibility of relying on imported animal feedstuffs because the Brazilian and US soybean production is likely to be hard hit. It means a necessity for food planning in Europe to ensure self-sufficiency in the face of declining yields. Now let's look at fuel. The International um, Panel on Climate Change estimate that if we are to prevent catastrophic climate change, total emissions must, must not exceed 800 billion tonnes of carbon. Now in 2013 we had only 270 billion tons left of that. We'd already emitted more than 530. And we were using them up at 11 billion tons a year. In 2019, we have about 205 billion margin, implying that we've got to totally stop using fossil fuels by 2037. If you're allowed to go on a bit longer, if you allow for tail off, run the sudden end. Now if we look at the current sources of energy used in Europe, um, these are solid fuels, this is oil, this is gas, uh, this is nuclear fuel, and this is renewable energy. Everything below that is fossil fuel. So overwhelmingly Europe still depends on fossil fuels. 72% of it. Now, there has been a fall. It's fallen from 78% in 2005 to 72% now. So it's fallen 5% in 10 years, falling by about half a percent a year. And we've got to get it right down essentially to zero in the next 20 years. That implies a fall of about 3% a year, five times faster than it's been achieved now. Not only does it imply closing down all coal, oil and gas power stations, but it will be necessary to build enough new nuclear and wind power stations to replace not only the electric supply that is currently provided by coal stations, but we have to replace all the other energy uses in heating, transport and process energy. You have to replace the gas and solid fuel that has been used to heat homes, the gas and solid fuel that has been used in industrial process heating. We have to replace the use of diesel and petrol, road transport, and shipping transport, aviation, etc. And there's a lot of process energy. Let's look at transport first. This is total use of energy. This is road vehicles. These are ships and aircraft. 
Rail transport uses very little of that energy. And this almost entirely parallels the oil-derived fuel use. Almost all of it is oil-derived fuel. We have a transport system almost entirely dependent on oil-derived fuel. The biggest single use is road transport. Things which will have to be done is immediately ban the manufacture of fossil fuel cars and buses. Slightly later, you can ban the manufacture of lorries and agricultural vehicles based on fossil fuels, since for these electric designs are not yet available. Beyond that, it means a big expansion of the rail network to handle long distance freight, which won't be practical with battery lorries. Battery lorries are only going to be usable to deliver rail, to, to deliver freight from rail sidings to sites within towns. Factories themselves will have to be built with rail sidings as they used to be um, until the mid uh, 20th century. What does this mean? It means a, a very large program of investment in more rail lines. It will have to be done much more rapidly than is currently being done in Europe. But it is possible to do this. China's rail path shows it's possible. It probably means a scaling down of the tourist industry. And because although people will be able to travel to southern Europe by train, probably a lot fewer people will want to do that than would do it if it was possible to fly there. Many airports will have to close or be radically reduced. Air transport will be largely run down. It is possible to have hydrogen fuel planes, but if you do that, the seating capacity is much reduced because hydrogen is very bulky and fuel costs are much higher because there's a series of energy inefficiencies in producing hydrogen. First, there's an inefficiency in electrolysis. Then you have to pressurize and refrigerate the hydrogen. Then you get the thermal loss in engines, which you are getting thermal loss anyway uh, because the high band pass gas turbines may be 40, 44% efficient. So although when we say that renewable energy is approaching the cost of fossil fuel energy. What people mean is that renewable electricity is approaching the cost of fossil fuel electricity. It doesn't mean that electrically derived fuels like electrolytic hydrogen are in any way competitive with fossil fuels. This is not just hypothetical. The Russians actually built a hydrogen-powered um, jet airliner by modifying an existing Tupolev, or the prototype was the TU-155, uh, which I show a photo of there. The, um, the commercial version, which they planned to produce, but it never turned out to be cost-effective, was the TU-156. As you can see, because liquid hydrogen is so bulky, the whole of the latter part of the fuselage has to be given over to, to the fuel. You therefore can seat many fewer passengers, maybe only two-thirds of the passengers you could seat otherwise, and the cost of the fuel is much greater. So the cost per passenger will be two or three times what it is now. Airfares will go up a lot, and a lot fewer people will travel by. We're in the age of globalization, and globalization depends on technology. It depends on two key technologies. The one I've just been talking about, the high bypass gas turbine for air, air travel, and the marine diesel engine for shipping. If you no longer have diesel fuel, what do, what do you have? There are three main alternatives. You could have nuclear powered ships. There were prototype nuclear cargo ships built in the 60s, but it's highly unlikely that these would be viable in a commercial environment. They're expensive, difficult to maintain, and it would probably be thought that the hazards involved with shipwrecks, etc., of nuclear powered vessels will rule that out. 
Now, we know that wind power is a viable technique for ships. Sailing ships existed long before steam or diesel ships, but they're much more expensive in manpower than powered ships. In principle, you could use liquid ammonia as a fuel for gas turbines. This is practical, but liquid ammonia is going to be expensive. So, although it will be possible to have ships fueled by liquid ammonia, the cost of synthesizing the fuel is so, so high that there is bound to be considerably reduced sea transport. When I say wind-powered ships, your initial image is probably of uh, square rig sailing ships, but there are other technologies. There's a technology developed in the 1930s, uh, 20s and 30s, called the Flettner rotor, which relies on a, an obscure effect that if wind is blowing over a rotating cylinder, it generates thrust. And by tuning the direction that the cylinder rotates in, you can have forward or reverse thrust. This was the on the top right here is the first Flettner rotor ship built in the in, in the 20s and 30s, and this is a modern prototype. It is viable to have these things with relatively lower manpower than the old sailing ships, but the ships will be much smaller than the modern bulk carrier. Uh, you don't get enough thrust to, to be um, travel at the speed that a modern bulk carrier could. Another key technology is steel. It's a major source of carbon dioxide production and capitalist civilization was built on steel. Now if you're going to phase out coal-based steel production, what does that imply? There are alternative ways of producing steel. You can use uh, hydrogen as a reducing agent instead of carbon monoxide, which is what's used in the, a blast furnace. But the cost per ton will be significantly higher since hydrogen from electrolysis is much more expensive than coke. The process is endothermic, that is to say it absorbs energy rather than releasing energy, so additional heat has to be supplied uh, by passing the hydrogen through an electric arc furnace to heat it up to high temperatures. And there's going to be a big capital cost of replacing Europe and the world's steel plant over a short period. How much more costly is um, direct reduction steel than um, existing steel? Well, it depends on your electricity costs. This uh, graph here computes the cost uh, of direct reduction steel as a function of the electric electricity cost in euros per megawatt hour. Since the range of commercial electricity costs in Europe is about um, just under high 40s, under 50 um, euros per kilowatt hour, we get a price which is not prohibitively more, but is maybe 30 or 40 percent more for, for steel than it is now. The implication is that we'll be able to afford to use less steel, and we're going to need a lot of power plants to provide the electrolysis and the heat. It's reckoned that uh, Germany alone is going to require 100 terawatt hours of additional electrical energy just to operate the steel industry. I said the issues were food, fuel, fire and flood. There are going to be direct risks associated with rising temperatures. Heat waves are already bringing frequent wildfires. These are going to become more common. 
deaths from heat stroke are going to rise, rise to horrific levels. In 2003, 70,000 people were killed in Europe by a heat wave. If the what's known as the wet bulb temperature rises above 35 degrees centigrade, people cannot get rid of their body heat by sweating, they overheat and die of heat stroke. Now, a wet bulb temperature is the temperature you register on a mercury thermometer if you stick the mercury bulb in a little sock of dampened cloth to mimic what happens to the human skin when it is uh, cooling itself by, by sweat. If we go to the extreme ends of projected climate change, 8 degrees, and look at the maximum wet bulb temperatures that you're going to encounter in different parts of the world. Anywhere above the, the 35 will be unsurvivable for human beings who are not in air-conditioned buildings. It doesn't mean the temperature is that high all year round. This is the maximum 24-hour sustained wet bulb temperature. But 24 hours at a wet bulb temperature above 35 is fatal. So you see that areas of surprisingly dense inhabitation, like the East Coast region, East and Midwest of the United States, most of India, the most densely part, populated parts of China, most of Egypt, these will reach temperature levels which are unsafe for human life. That includes some parts of the southern areas of Europe as well. These are obviously relatively inexact maps because they're based on simulations, but it gives you an indication of the areas which are currently centres of human civilization, of human population, which are going to essentially become uninhabitable. That's for a, a worst case Eocene type scenario. The Eocene period was the period when those wet redwood trees grew in the Arctic. If you take the simplest physics only models of climate change, ones which are not general computational models, but simple physics models, which don't take into account any feedback relations, and you project forward current emissions of carbon, we reach that kind of temperature in the mid to late 200s, sorry, 2100s. But we know that sudden phase changes associated with thawing resulted in five degree jumps, possibly in only 10 years at the end of the ice age. There are feedback effects from methane, melted ar Arctic ice, reducing albedo, all of these can result in non-linear effects. So rapid change may occur much sooner than the late 2100s. The order of changes are, are going to be food problems first, fuel changes have to be undertaken in line with that. And that's a time scale over the next 20, 20 years. Heat problems will start being really severe by the last part of the last half of the century for Europe, but for other areas they're already severe. Large areas of Australia this year experience temperatures of 45 degrees. And then after that come centuries of rising sea levels. This would imply abandoning most coastal cities. 
it would imply building new cities on high ground. It would imply moving ports upriver beyond the tidal reach of the rivers because uh, it'll be unviable to have ports downstream in the current tidal areas. This is just the area that would be lost with a five meter inundation. Together, these imply large scale population movement. There will have to be a deliberate depopulation of low altitude southern parts of the European continent, either permanently or at least in summer. And people will have to move to the north or to new towns in the mountains where the temperature will not reach such extreme levels. The flood danger will mean the abandonment of coastal and floodplains almost permanently. Again, tens of millions of people will have to be rehoused on higher ground. If you look at the terminal flood scenario of complete deglaciation, uh, a deglaciation comparable to that which occurred at the start of the Holocene, you can see the North Sea will intrude right into much of uh, Holland and Northern Germany. The, the Baltic will overflow its banks and uh, cover large areas of Poland. The Baltic states will completely disappear. Uh, southern Sweden, Denmark will disappear. Much of England will disappear. The Spain and some France, Central Europe will be okay, but these are going to be areas which are particularly heavily affected by temperature. So the range of good agricultural land in this area here is eventually going to be flooded and population is largely going to have to move very far north or up into the mountains. Now heat change will produce social change. The last great warming moved Europe from hunting to agriculture. So what social change is implied and what's going to happen? The first point to notice there's going to have to be a really huge restructuring of the economy. Huge investments, huge movements of population, massive changes in infrastructure. And this is going to be done in a short period of time, around 20 years. I can only think of two cases where such change has been achieved before in such a short period of time. Wartime mobilization of capitalist economies and the first Soviet five-year plan. In these cases, in all these cases, you had a strong state directing the economy to achieve national goals. And there are two big options, therefore, both compatible with state direction. State capitalism or a full socialist planned economy. We'll look at both, but first at the features they have in common. The common features are that the state plans the main features of the economy in material terms, not money terms. The state directs labour from inessential to essential sectors. It imposes various forms of rationing to restrict private consumption. The state finances the needed, the needed investment. An investment in new infrastructure has to be very high. Um, for example, recent Chinese rapid industrialization has involved 45% of economic output going into new investment. Now, if we take a state capitalist option, which is more or less uh, what happened in war economies and what's happening to a large extent in China, slightly less in China. 
Most production is still in the hands of private firms, but these firms work under state direction and state orders. There is labour supply rationing in essential sectors like banking, advertising, sales promotion would have employment quotas reduced. There would be rationing at least of carbon, probably other goods, and would have to be extensive state rights to requisition land for national use. People at the moment worry about unemployment, but in the kind of restructuring we're talking about, the labour supply will be soon, very rapidly, the major constraint on the levels of infrastructure investment needed. Occupations will have to be categorised according to how vital they are of achieving the goals of environmental adaptation. There will have to be direction of labour out of services into agriculture, construction and capital goods. Wartime experience shows this becomes necessary within a couple of years of mobilising the economy. The experience of both the First and Second World Wars bears this out. When I talk about carbon rationing, I'm talking about something similar to the, the American system of pet petrol rationing introduced during the 1970s oil crisis. All citizens there got an equal petrol ration, and they could sell these if they were in excess of their own use, their own need. Commercial firms would have to buy the rations from citizens. You, en you would end up with garages acting as um, exchanges for the unwanted rations. And the total ration is reduced each year in a predictable way. The economic effect of this is redistributive towards those on low incomes, unlike carbon tax schemes, which hit those on low incomes worst. On financing, the state is going to have to spend what it needs from newly created money, which it then mops up using tax and bond issues. Income tax levels will have to be set to reduce luxury expenditure to a minimum. As an example, in 1945, when we still had a state capitalist economy in Britain, the income tax for the very rich was at 97.5%. Um, you might actually put a tax on bank deposits to encourage people to buy state bonds. The idea of an in-kind economy versus a monetary economy was promoted by the economist Otto Neurath, who had been involved in planning the German economy during the First World War. And he emphasised that what war economy taught you was that what was important was not money, stocks and shares, bonds, etc. It was the actual flows and usage of material goods. Now, you can achieve that partly in a state capitalist economy, but you can achieve it better in a socialist economy, where all the major firms either become state-owned or workers' cooperatives. And the cooperative firms would still have to work under state direction to meet essential environmental targets. You would have state purchasing boards for agriculture and private farmers would have to meet planned targets for quantity, composition of food supplies in the face of the impending shortages. You would introduce a system of cybernetic planning. Uh, computer technology in Europe is mature enough to allow this kind of planning down to the individual barcode level. The planning could be drawn up using linear programming or modern, more modern techniques to make sure we use all labour resources and meet the carbon and other environmental targets and meet real and in real time meet essential consumer targets. In conclusion, Europe faces potentially catastrophic changes brought about by anthropogenic climate change. These changes can be reduced, but not entirely eliminated by directive planning. The planning could either be state capitalist or it could be socialist, the difference being who owns industry. And 
it will involve radical changes in social relations. In either case, extensive use will have to be made of modern computational techniques in order to direct and integrate the economy.